Good so, afternoon. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to hear about the work of your state legislature in today's online town hall hosted by your 30th district lawmakers, Senator Claire Wilson and Representative Jamila Taylor. Some of you have submitted questions in advance, and I will relay those questions to the lawmakers. If we run out of time before we get to all questions, or if a new question occurs to you during or after the town hall, please contact either lawmaker's office in Olympia for a response. Also during this event, Muhir al Volunte will be providing live Spanish language interpretation at a local viewing party. So if our lawmakers sound as if they're talking a little more slowly than normal, it's to enable to the interpreter to keep up in real time. We'll start in a moment with questions right after each lawmaker gives some brief opening remarks. I'll hand it over to you, Representative Taylor, to get us started. Thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Representative Jamila Taylor. I'm representing this wonderful district, the 30th District. I, I know that there's a lot of interested um, folks online who are watching from other districts. And so we're centered around Federal Way, Auburn, Pacific, Algona, parts of Des Moines, um, and really just essentially South King County. And I'm just honored to be here with our seatmate, the great Senator Claire Wilson. I currently serve as a chair of the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee. So if you imagine the, the civil litigation type of cases um, and matters, um, those come before me, family law, probate, um, business contracts, those kinds of issues come before my particular committee. I also serve on the Human Services Youth and Early Learning Committee. And I, um, lastly, I also serve on housing, the Housing Committee. Um, outside of that work, I am serving as the chair of the Developmental and Disability Advocacy Caucus. It's a bicameral, so both House and Senate members, as well as um, bipartisan committee, where um, both Republicans and Democrats are working towards solutions to help our developmental dis the developmental disability community and their families and supports. And I will kick it over to Senator Wilson and um, for her introduction. Thanks so much, Rep. Taylor and uh, Senator Claire Wilson, proud, proud Senator of the 30th Legislative District. And this will be my sixth session in the Senate. So really feeling like um, I've got my feet on the ground and I'm so um, absolutely humbled to have uh, Rep. Taylor as my seatmate. I sit as chair of the Human Services Committee and that covers all issues related to human services, related to uh, child welfare, our juvenile justice system, as well as youth development, also corrections. And when I talk about corrections, it's everything outside of the judicial system. It's what I talk about is the climate and the culture of what happens not only inside our institutions and facilities, um, but also as individuals are reintegrating and coming back into our communities, the reentry side of things as well. I also sit as vice chair of Early Learning K-12 in the Senate, I sit on transportation, so wheels and planes and trains and boats are important to me, and ferries are too. Um, and I also sit on rules committees, so have an opportunity to uh, have a hand in bringing uh, important bills to the floor so that we're able to vote on them and then get them through the system. So uh, really proud to be here today. And I think both Rep. Taylor and I thought we would just kick things off. Um, talking a little bit about the initiatives uh, that you may or may not have heard about. And there are six current initiatives uh, that were brought forward uh, that uh, I know many individuals have been waiting to hear uh, what the legislature was going to do in response to them. And uh, so what uh, you may have seen is uh, communication, I believe, yesterday from leadership from both the House and the Senate and wanted to share today uh, with uh, you all what we do know. So uh, we will be doing hearings on the police pursuit initiative, on the state income tax initiative, and on the parental rights initiative. And those three hearings will happen uh, on either the 27th of February 
or the 28th of February. And the details we'll know more um, in this coming week. So what that means is both the House and Senate committees that cover those areas will do a joint hearing where we'll have public comment on the initiatives and then each chamber, the House and the Senate, will uh, discuss those initiatives in their individual caucuses and determine how they will move them forward in an executive session in those um, in those committees, executive session, and then how they'll move forward on the floors based on um, how they come out of committee. The other three um, initiatives, the uh, uh, Climate Commitment Act, the Capital Gains Tax, and the Washington Long-Term Care Retirement Program will not have hearings in the House or the Senate, which means they will go to a ballot for uh, the vote of the people. And I know as we move forward this morning or this afternoon now, uh, we have questions already that people have asked about those. So we will chat more about those specifics of those as we move forward, but felt it was really important to answer the questions around what are we doing with the six initiatives that are sitting out there? And so with just to clarify with the initiatives, whether they're getting a hearing or going straight to the ballot, um, there are certain things that we're able to do and certain things that we're not able to do. So if the um, initiative is going straight to the ballot, the voters get to vote specifically on what was presented to us. So you have a direct hand in making the decision on whether or not we would continue with our um, climate commitment dollars, for example. Um, I know that there are a number of folks who have um, are very much interested in what we're doing in that space, and we'll get to that very soon. And those of you who are very much interested in what we're going to do in response to vehicle pursuits, we're going to have a hearing on that, and the procedures around that will be uh, clarified um, down the road on what we can do in response to um, the hearing in executive action. So we don't have all of the detail today, but I, I assure you the legislature is addressing it and, and both Senator Wilson and I have responded publicly to the inquiries that were on the news regarding um, the police uh, pursuit questions out there. And we will continue to uh, work with our colleagues and law enforcement on responses around vehicle pursuit. So I, I just wanna make sure that we are clarifying where we are in the process. We are not ignoring the issue in any shape or form. Uh, we do have to work within the parameters of the, the um, procedures of the legislature. Okay, so now we, if we move to specific questions, Floyd of Auburn wants to know, what is your opinion on Senate Bill 5770, which would adjust the property tax cap? Well, I'll start because uh, it's a, it was a Senate bill and it was sponsored by Senator Peterson and there was lots of confusion around this bill. First thing I'll say is the bill did not move and will not be uh, heard um, and it did not move off the Senate floor and it will not be heard in the House. And what it had to do was just removing uh, an arbitrary 1% property tax cap and providing uh, cities and individual municipalities the opportunity to raise that uh, cap based on their constituencies. And uh, many people thought it was automatically going to happen and everyone was going to be impacted. It did not raise the taxes, it just allowed, it was permissive. And um, it also, uh, it, it just, there was a lot of confusion. And so just say straight out, uh, it is not uh, moving anywhere and you will not be impacted by uh, 5770. 
And to clarify, 5770 was related to King County alone. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Rep. Taylor. And, and it was essentially in response by King County having a significant deficit in their budget um, and finding solutions to help fill those gaps as they've already made some um, uh, cuts in staffing or planned cuts in staffing, uh, yet they're still a big uh, hole. And with their budget being more than 70% um, in public safety, uh, we're all pretty significantly concerned about their ability to keep up with the um, public safety needs of King County. And it would allow flexibility, much more flexibility in their use of dollars, which again would allow them to cover some of those additional needs, as you're saying. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So Dave in Federal Way says thousands of dollars of merchandise are stolen from stores every day. Is there legislation legislation to address this issue? I could I could jump in here. I have sponsored um, a proviso that would have partnerships between law enforcement and the retail um, authority, the retail merchants authority. So large organizations like um, uh, Walmart and Target, um, as well as small merchants, or retail shops who are part of this retail. Um, organization. And, and I also know that the um, AG's office is convening a retail theft uh, workforce. And where we're looking at are multiple levels of resources for uh, theft deterrent for small um, businesses that you know, cannot um, afford a large uh, systems update um, and, and uh, capital dollars. Um, that to to invest in, in preventing theft um, and also um, opportunities to engage with um, early intervention services for retailers who see the same individuals coming in who may have other challenges in their life that lead them to these poverty related crimes get them um, some of the supports that they need uh, especially since they're engaging in behaviors that have them in, enter acting with the judicial system. It's accountability um, upstream and, and to help folks get the help that they need uh, and address the challenges that they're going through. Um, and, and so I know that the retailers want um, some additional action. And I think it's that coordinated effort between the state, local law enforcement, community partners on sustainable solutions. And, and they're at the table with us. Um, I will also say there's a bill that crossed the Senate floor 49 to 0 headed to the House uh, that's related to uh, further defining the crime of organized retail theft, because we know that, again, is an issue. So you can look to that as well at Senate Bill 5160, and I'm certain that will um, make its way through the House as we um, come to the end of our uh, opposite chamber uh, hearings on bills. Yes. And one other thing to um, add is that we've been hearing from constituents and other stakeholders who are very much concerned about the safety of the workers who are often tasked with intervening when someone's involved in theft. So um, these solutions really also need to take into consideration mm -hmm. staff who are um, confronting individuals who are engaging in this uh, criminal behavior. Great. And I wondered if one of you might want to just touch briefly on the difference between a proviso and a bill, just for some folks out there who might not know. So a proviso is basically a, a section of our budget bill. So it's a, an, um, it's a legislative ask for dollars and resources in the budget. Um, so we have three parts of our budget. We have our operating budget, we have our capital budget, and we have our transportation budget. And um, the in terms of the proviso that I am referencing, it would be in our operating budget um, to support ongoing um, activities that are coordinated between the state, um, local officials, and actually sometimes federal, because um, some of our um, retail theft um, uh, crime rings are um, cross state lines, and there's a federal tie as well. And, and when you have a piece of legislation or a bill, there's a fiscal note that's attached to it. And so that is uh, what is how you would fund the bill, actually, that you were writing. So there's two different ways to fund. One is if you have a statute or a piece of legislation, 
and the chambers budget that into their budget. Another is if you just ask for money out of a budget, and that's kind of like a line item ask, if you will, as opposed to attached to a certain piece of legislation. Thank you. Um, Jack and Pacific is wondering why Senate Bill 5795 didn't make it past its public hearing, and that would eliminate daylight savings. Well, it did not make it out of committee. And in order for a bill to move forward, it has to A, be heard in committee. Second, it has to be exec out of that committee and the committee has to agree. And then we have an opportunity to hear it on the floor of either the House or the Senate. That bill is an interesting one because again, there's a federal issue around daylight savings time. This is, I believe, the second or third time we've tried to vote on this as a body. Um, and there was an amendment, I believe, to do something around just maintaining Pacific Standard Time. And, and then once the feds decided to do a change, but that did not, that was in a substitute in that um, committee, but it did not move out. And so there's pros and cons. People like it and some don't. Um, and uh, we just are not going to have an opportunity to respond to that this session. Um, Paulo in Auburn asks, why does my rent keep increasing? There's so many factors there. Um, well, uh, I would say uh, rents keep increasing because landlords can keep increasing rents. Uh, they will tell us over and over they're going to increase the rents um, based on what the market will bear. And what we're finding is that a lot of individuals aren't able to leave the rental market and purchase homes because they're so very expensive. And that constrains um, the options and, and the supply. So that means that there's more competition for fewer rental um, properties. And so the, the, that means that rents go up. Uh, I know that there is House Bill 2114, rent stabilization to control those costs. Mm -hmm. um, um, renters have told us over and over and uh, that they need help, uh, that there, some families are paying more than 50% of their income um, on uh, rent. And it is incredibly uh, expensive in this region to be able to have uh, um, affordable housing um, and be able to work in the Seattle market. So we're addressing that through the rent stabilization bill. And we're hoping that the Senate will consider um, this piece of legislation you know, as a way to support the swath of people who are not homeowners, that they're renters. And, and, you know, if your rent keeps going up higher and higher, you will have less and less to save to purchase a home. And the cycle can continue if we don't do something about that right now. Okay. Um, just to segue back for a second, since we were talking about some basic government, Eddie shot a question through that asks, who determines the need for a bill to be written and submitted by elected officials? Well, you know, oh, that's such a good question. Uh, you all do. Um, many bills uh, that I write um, and that I sponsor come from individuals who find me, call me, meet with me, email me, and either have an idea, uh, have a challenge or a concern, uh, or have an issue that they um, have not been able to address. And uh, many bills that come out of the legislature come from groups of individuals who have come together and said, you know, this is important for us and this is an issue. Uh, the bills I do in early learning come from Many, not only parents who are in our pro, um, in our communities, but from individuals who are in that workforce. Uh, K-12 bills come many from scholars who have thoughts about the systems and how they are either working or not working. Um, and uh, many come from the agencies also who are working with uh, constituents across the state and realize that there have been systems in place that are not meeting the needs of our communities and have never been put in place to help people out of them. 
And so many of the laws we do, I think, are trying to disrupt those kinds of systems and help people up and out as opposed to keep people um, from being thriving, successful folks that we all want to be. Okay. Um, Katrina in Auburn is wondering, what can you do to give unpaid caretakers financial relief if they get fired and don't qualify for Medicaid? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, mm. We need to have a meeting about that to really understand um, uh, how you're in the world of unpaid caregiving. Um, sometimes you might qualify for paid caregiving depending on your, your circumstance. For example, if you have an adult child um, with developmental disabilities, you might be eligible to be paid as a caregiver. Um, uh, if you have a child that is under 18, we're working on legislation um, uh, over the next couple of biennium to um, allow parents to, um, to be paid as uh, uh, caregivers for those children with high uh, complex medical needs that are beyond what a standard parenting world is. Um, and so I, I think we could look at the context of what kind of caregiving you're giving. Um, sometimes families just didn't know that they have access to resources. And I think that our systems uh, can do a better job of reaching our residents around how they can get the support that they need, especially in the caregiving world. Uh, in, in my work in her, uh, human services, I do a lot of work with TANF, Temporary Aid for Needy Families, thinking a lot about how is it that we provide uh, perhaps support for individuals before they have to go on state need and are there ways that we can help support families to fill those gaps. We also have heard a number of bills on guaranteed basic income. And um, again, um, until we have a, a living wage and a base wage, um, people struggle every single day. And again, um, every individual situation is a little different. So yours, again, it's worthy of a conversation as Rep Taylor said, would love to follow up. But both of us have a deep interest in making sure uh, that individuals have what they need and need what they have. And um, I think, you know, really supporting um, and finding out if there are gaps we don't know about, that's our job to help figure out um, how we fill those needs. Um, so would love to, again, have more conversation around that and uh, find out a little bit more about the particular situation. On, on a personal note, I know what it's like to leave the job market to do unpaid caregiving. Well, first thing I will say is that it's not my gift. <laughs> so anyone who does this, um, you are doing God's work. Uh, on a full-time basis. Um, I also say that there are a lot of uh, families where individuals do come out of the job market um, to do that. We, we care deeply about our family members and want the very best service and best options. And it is, it is something that's so complex that you just can't work full time and be able to care for your spouse who may have, um, you know, challenges with cancer or may not be able. You have an adult child with developmental disabilities or um, other circumstances that lead you into the world that you never expected um, uh, because of trauma or um, an accident and things like that. So these are why I know that uh, Senator Claire Wilson and I are so passionate about the safety net because life happens and life changes in an instant. Jeff in Des Moines and Melissa in Federal Way have had similar questions and it basically it's they're worried about public safety with the rise in gun violence and cr criminal activity and say they don't feel safe. And mm -hmm. they're asking, do you, would you say gun safety or police reform legislation has made an impact? I think there is, there's opportunity for us to invest in community. I will tell you, um, part of my life's work has been youth violence prevention and getting kids into services and um, youth development programs and jobs. It's, it's about getting uh, our families and community members into the resources that they need. Uh, as, as things get tighter and tighter in community, 
we we really need to respond to what really gets people out of those systems. Uh, and so my my belief is that we need to invest more in community, also being um, very targeted around how our public safety dollars are spent. There are things in terms of technology that um, our local police departments could be investing in, uh, in terms of uh, you know reducing the risk of high speed pursuits. Um, it, it, that that would be great. Um, it would be great if we invested more in youth jobs. Um, it would be great if we invested more in opportunities for our kids to be involved in youth development and, and spending time with positive adults so that they have a sense of other options. Um, we really need to look at what is driving our young people in particular. They're, they're not the only ones engaged in things that are unsafe for our community, but what are driving them into those activities that we can um, uh, intervene and ensure that they have the resources. I know those resources work because one of the best metrics is when a, one, when a young person says to me, I completed this uh, apprenticeship program, what's next? What can I do next? That is one of the best metrics that we know that we can keep our kids safe, keep our family safe, and help everyone feel part of this community. I'll just say uh, I've spent the last 40 some years in early learning. And the reason I do that is because that's the best return on investment that we can make. And I think for many, many years, um, support for families in the early years uh, were seen as poverty programs and only for families who had less than. And what we know is that there is not one family uh, that doesn't need some kind of a support. And it is also an economic recovery strategy that if families do not know that their children are safe within someone else's care, they are fearful and afraid and don't have community as we used to, uh, to have care and can't afford a care um, unless we do support that. And it's a three-legged stool. It's parental support. It's the support of businesses who know that they need to have employees who they can count on and who can focus on the job because again, they know their kids are safe. And then it's also around what state role um, and what we play. And um, again, I'm gonna throw out here the cap gains tax because one of the issues around that is that that has what has created our opportunity in the state to provide some stability in our funding for care for our children. And if that goes away, we lose. Um, that huge investment. I was able to do Fair Start for Kids Act in 2021. It was the largest investment that we've ever made historically in this state and is the way that we can help support families early and often. Um, again, I work in the youth development space. Uh, I work in the juvenile justice space. But I'll also say, as we think about juveniles, the county plays a huge role in the system, because in the juvenile rehabilitation system in the state, um, the opportunity to work with young people comes after they've been convicted of crimes and then are placed often in a state, whether it's Echo Glen or Green Hill. But there are a number of opportunities before that, whether through human services, through the child welfare system, through our school systems, through our community programs before and after school, where we can provide supports for young people so their hearts and minds are kept busy and they understand that they're valued and valuable and worthy of the investment. So um, I will continue to do that work. I think the other thing is the behavioral health and mental health needs of our young people. And as we think about uh, the issue around our drug situation and substance use disorder um, and what we know is happening, not only in our state, but across the country. Those are all things that uh, we have to attend to. And I say humans cost money, lots and lots of money. And this is something we've got to invest in, in order to move us forward as um, a community. Uh, so let me also add, just before we move on from there, um, I, I touched on um, some of the uh, 
law enforcement and community engagement on the retail theft uh, task force with the AG's office. Um, I, I know that we've uh, convened um, the Catholic Converter um, 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 uh, Task Force and we've seen dramatic shifts there. I know that in terms of um, uh, the, the cannabis stores are asking for um, federal recognition so they can use banking systems instead of keeping cash on hand. Um, so working with uh, the state treasurer and his advocacy to our federal uh, delegation. If you don't recall, our state treasurer is our very own Mike Pellicciotti, who right. is doing amazing work advocating for um, us in, in community as well. Um, um, also helping you get your dollars back into your pocket with unclaimed property. So sometimes it's not as sexy when we're talking about the the treasurer's work, but he's working on behalf of us as well on these things that are interconnected. Um, and, and let me not forget law enforcement assisted diversion and recovery navigator programs who are redirecting people. Because one of the things I've heard from law enforcement is like, you, we're still getting more than 50% of our calls for a behavioral health call. So as we're you know, deploying 988, the suicide prevention line, the behavioral health line, I'm redirecting resources there in, in federal way. We um, have a receiving center. My hope is that the mayor will um, authorize the county to move forward with the dollars that they are investing in that center. Um, I, I know that there are so many folks who are asking for us to respond to the crisis that's in our borders. Um, that we can't just shift it off to another community to deal with. We we have opportunities here to to really address the 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 crime situation and community safety from multiple levels: youth violence prevention, youth crime prevention, um, uh, substance use treatment, getting folks housed and into stable supports, um, getting um, our behavioral health system fully funded and up and running. With the capital dollars. I mean almost a billion dollars. It takes a lot of time to spend a billion dollars in the right places all over the community and, in, and ensure that we are um, continuing to respond to the community as they are asking us to, to take action. So um, I'm asking you to bear with us as we deploy those resources um, as, um, as the community is asking for them. Can I... Could I also add that we do have the new toxicology lab in Federal Way that you may not be aware of and that is the Washington State Patrol. It was a, a, an incredibly wonderful new uh, state-of-the-art facility, four times the size. And they are working on the uh, DUI uh, toxicology tests as we think about um, alcohol and drugs and what we know about, again, uh, what we've seen on the roads as far as um, our increase in um, traffic fatalities and uh, you know, just the, just the rise in um, high speed and all of those things. I also think we cannot ignore um, issues related to harm reduction. Um, and I know this is a controversial and a very sometimes misunderstood issue, but we have many different ways we need to address um, the concerns we have, the public health issues we have, again, with substance use disorder and harm reduction or pathways to... Uh, addiction services and supports. We have to think about medically assisted treatment. Um, and that happens um, very successfully in many of our jail systems. And we've got to, again, provide individuals with the support they need in order to be successful. And um, those kinds of things I know are very emotional kinds of conversations. We all have different experiences around that, um, but there is not one answer, which makes this such a, uh, um, a complex issue, I think, um, with complex answers that uh, take some time to see. Oh, but wait, there's more. Okay, so part of the community had responded, it was asking us to respond around our police academies. As you may know, just north of us in the 33rd district is our state police academy in Burien. Um, but that there's a huge burden for folks who want to go to into the police academy who live in other communities but can't leave their families, men and women every day who want to step up to serve in the line of duty. So we responded um, with legislation that was proposed by uh, Senator Lovick to have <laughs> regional academies. And what I will tell you, those academies are full. 
Those academies are full of folks who are ready to serve our communities and be deployed to support efforts to stem violence, efforts to stem domestic violence. I, I will tell you in the 30th district, we have a challenge. We have one of the highest reports of domestic violence in our community and, and having a, law, a proper law enforcement or response to that is going to be critical. So as a DV attorney, I definitely want to see our coordinated response and ensuring that we have um, folks able to intervene in emergencies and intervene to keep um, um, our shopkeepers safe as they are doing our retail, making folks feel comfortable to um, go out to, to dinner. These are all important to all of us, all of us. Um, and if, again, when law enforcement is still responding to a lot of behavioral health, we're deploying other resources like co-responders with that. So uh, Senator Wilson really understands the human services side of that um, aspect. And, and I'm here to support her with that work. And I know our, our state is um, ready to stand uh, in support of our entire community. Okay. A couple of questions focused on public dining. Uh, one from L Larissa in Federal Way is wondering if there might be legislation regarding food and restaurant employees that would mandate wearing gloves and masks to reduce the spread of foodborne illness. What I would say to that is, you know, we have um, Department of Health and the Board of Health have uh, rules uh, around um, Oh, oh, my little brain just went dead here. Um, preparation of food um, with license and stuff. And I guess, um, you know, they keep track and uh, really, I think, have their pulse on that. And so um, if you uh, have a specific concern around a particular restaurant or something, um, that would be an important thing. There is the line that you can call through um, the Board of Health or Department of Health. It's restaurant, it's complaints. Um, but it would be, um, I would be looking for guidance and looking for um, the Department of Health and the Board of Health to make the decisions related to uh, change in practice or um, new laws or legislation around that. I would look for their guidance from that and have not myself seen anything this session related to that. And Rep. Taylor, I'm not sure um, if you have or not. Haven't. Okay. Uh, Calvin in Auburn wants to know, is there a way to bring better dine-in restaurants to Auburn? That's a good question. Um, I think that is definitely a local partnership that we could have with our mm -hmm. uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, our city officials. Um, I, I know that I've heard from business leaders that um, there's a significant concern around permitting and the timelines on that. And, and I know at the state level, we've done some efforts to streamline permits, uh, permitting process for building out. Um, our, our downtown core is gonna change dramatically when we get light rail in two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the opportunity is now for more businesses to come our way and whatever we can do to partner with you to see what you want. Um, I know that there's an effort to bring a public market that would have a lot of international cuisine and, and cl um, clothing options in our area. Uh, so I am very much interested in partnering with local leaders uh, to bring more retail opportunities into our area. And, and, and I, quite frankly, I like shopping here. I'd rather shop here than drive all the way up to Seattle. So, you know, let's, let's make this place a fun place to um, shop, to go out to dinner, to um, see a show. Uh, this is um, a great place to live. You know, and I, I would add, I'm not going to, you know, we cannot forget the pandemic. And we did have a number of restaurants locally that I know have, were um, devastatingly impacted mm -hmm. um, by the lack of their ability to be flexible just because of the situation and because oftentimes family owned small businesses and did not survive the pandemic. And so um, although uh, ESSER dollars came in federally and we as a state um, tried to respond and be nimble, um, I know that many were impacted. And so hopefully this is a time of kind of revival, if you will, and renewal, and that we can continue to work together, as Rep. Taylor said, 
um, to really uh, revitalize and to um, just uh, highlight, if you will, the beauty of the 30th Legislative District. I, I really don't know if people um, that don't live here know that we are a beautiful place in space and uh, would love to have people come spend their money here. And uh, as a, a resident here, I'd like to spend my time here as well. So uh, let's continue this conversation and um, also, you know, think about uh, how we bring dollars in and how we think about building uh, community and that's housing and that is um, bringing in options for people, whether you're condos or whether you live in an apartment or whether you live in a home. Um, we have to make this a place where people can afford to live and want to live. And I think what you're talking about is what makes a community a community. Well, right. And, and didn't you sponsor some um, walkability uh, projects in the transportation budget? I mean, well, like I'm, uh, I'm all about safe routes to schools. I'm all about pedestrian safety. I'm all about sidewalks. Um, those are all the things, you know, that we need to consider. And I'll just say where there was a little sweet bill this session, people didn't really, um, I think they either really loved it or they hated it. And it was about, um, it was about crossing without a crosswalk. And, um, and when we think about pedestrian safety, um, it was also important to think about who our community is. And I live in an unincorporated Auburn. And there are many places and spaces in our community where we don't necessarily have sidewalks. And so as we think about how we make our place space, we, uh, how we make our spaces um, safe, we also have to consider the different environments and how we, how we do that. So yes, walkable communities, safe communities, multimodal communities um, are incredibly important as well. Yeah, I, one of the things I've heard over and over is that our public transportation is just not the same, it's not as robust as it is up in Seattle and that uh, we need those investments. So as folks are looking to come east, west to, to light rail, we're gonna see routes change down here in South King County and we're gonna have more flexibility. Also, when we're talking about CCA dollars, I, I gotta go there. Uh, so, you know, I'm hearing folks say, well, we need more places to, to um, charge our EVs. And, and, uh, and so like I've seen the transformation um, in the downtown core where you can charge your uh, Tesla and your other EV vehicles. I'm in the market to buy a new vehicle. And, and that is a question I have is like, where can I charge my EVs? And then I know that our local mayor has also, and I say our, you know, because Federal Way is here. Um, the, the mayor has submitted a request for EV chargers at the um, uh, at the, the center, the, the community center. So um, there will be opportunities for us to continue to participate in things that keep our environment safe here in the community. I know that um, a lot of families are looking for additional weatherization um, for their homes and potential um, solar panels. I, I, I remember um, walking one of the neighborhoods one year and seeing um, this home that had so many panels on it that they're delivering power to the electric station. So can you imagine in this place where we have a lot of rain, you're still able to deliver power back to the, the power grid, if you will. So there's a lot of innovation going on in our district when, when we're talking about um, how we participate in environmental, uh, environmentally friendly activities. Um, and, uh, you know, my hope is that we'll get electric school buses. I think that's something that might be in your purview on transportation at some point. But like that, that will be great because I know I used to get really sick when I was on the school bus with those fumes and everything. And if we can move towards electric school buses, that's something... These are buses that are built in Washington State for Washingtonians. We got to do something like that. So I just want to take a step back and say CCA is the Climate Commitment Act. Um, and so I want to make sure folks know that. And I want to add a bit. And um, as a Girl Scout all my life, um, one of the other pieces <laughs> of the Climate Commitment Act, that's something that uh, Rep. Taylor and I have in common. We also have to think about how we're protecting you know, our forests and our rivers and our urban trees, uh, the watersheds and all of the green spaces. And 
you know, you've seen some of those things as we think about Camp Kilworth, which is now the Kilworth Educational and Environmental Preserve, a uh, really incredible partnership between strong community, between the Y, between Forterra, Puyallup Tribal Nation. Those things are incredibly important, as well as we think about uh, the Seaport Alliance that is working between the Port of Seattle and Port of Tacoma, and how we're looking at restoration and mitigation of harm that's been done before and how we're working with salmon and working with our tribal partners, again, to make sure that these are green and clean spaces and also creating new uh, jobs around clean manufacturing sectors and also clean energy. So all of these things just critically important and clean air. I mean, yeah. we're in the pathway of our airport. And so those particulates are really important for us to make sure that our children, our, everyone is, um, has clean air. And as we're looking at um, the air filters in our schools, um, it, how we are com converting over, um, those are things that are on our mind to, to ensure, again, our children are healthy and safe. And these are things that um, constituents come to us over and over and over and over. I don't know that you can live in South King County and not hear about um, the issues around the airport, <laughs> uh, literally and figuratively. But, uh, you know, working in partnership with the 33rd District uh, legislators, as well as our neighbors um, on the 47th um, uh, in South King County uh, um, around clean air initiatives for um, our families here. A perhaps somewhat related public health question comes from Mike, who lives in Federal Way, but works in Seattle mm -hmm. and would like to be able to use his bike to commute, but has trouble finding a safe route between Federal Way and the Interurban Trail. He says the few available routes include high-speed arterials and narrow winding roads with poor visibility. Is there anything being done that would improve this? You know, what I can say from a transportation perspective is we have a very large multimodal caucus and uh, really looking at uh, how across our transportation space, we think about all types, uh, two wheels, four wheels, three wheels, uh, trains, planes, bikes, ferries, all of those things. And so... Uh, very strong advocacy, also groups from the outside as we think about, again, Climate Commitment Act, which is going to allow us uh, to do much more in this space as we think about how we're creating those opportunities. Um, specific to interurban trail, I don't have a particular answer, but I would love to be able to follow up with you and please reach out to my office and we can kind of see and plug you into what is currently happening Rep. Taylor may have more uh, thoughts on that or more info, but again, lots of things happening in those spaces and places with our uh, with our neighbors, but also with our community nonprofits and uh, and organizations and advocacy um, groups outside of the legislature. I, I would I would agree in, in making sure that um, not just to the interurban trail, but to um, you know, your locations throughout the district to our, our light rail station and to our um, bus stations. Um, if you have a safe route to get from your home to those locations where I know you can bring your, you know, your electric bike or your uh, standard bike on the, the, um, on the bus or the light rail, we want to ensure that we're growing out those opportunities. And I, I would say that since um, I've been in office, um, our transportation chairs have been committed to looking at um, um, multimodals, very so uh, alternatives to being in a car as you're wanting to participate in reducing our carbon footprint. So um, I know that if I had a safe way to ride I, I'm, I'm, I probably would need an electric bike. I'll admit that. Um, but if I had an opportunity to ride an electric bike to um, light rail, um, I would uh, use that opportunity and, and, and then find ways to explore the city once I get up to Seattle if, um, if with my, my, bicycle, my bicycle, if you will. Uh, Richard, also in Federal Way, wants to know the legislative status of state acquisition of the former Weyerhaeuser corporate headquarters site 
it, hopefully to maintain a balance of economic development, open space, and environmental protection. You know, I, what I can say is that, um, you know, the property in, in total is um, owned by IRG, which is a uh, real estate development uh, corporation. And um, I had a planning grant uh, the session before last to think about what potentially we might be able to do with the uh, landmark Weyerhaeuser building. Uh, we were able to get um, landmark status on the outside of the building so that the structure, as it appears, um, remains because of that um, preservation status. Uh, but also had done some work to try to figure out what it would take on the inside uh, to uh, renovate because there needs to be renovation and I think abatement of some other things there. And so Department of Enterprise Services, which is uh, the state's uh, purviewer, I guess, and the one that it makes the determination around buildings and capital uh, acquisitions, uh, made a, you know, made, uh, did their due diligence um, and made a determination that the costs of renovation did not outweigh uh, and was not a good investment for the state to make. And that was happening because at the time uh, we were looking at um, relocating the criminal justice training center, which you heard Rep. Taylor speak about earlier, that's currently in Burien. And uh, we're, we're doing some conversations around co-location of uh, the Criminal Justice Training Center um, in that building and in a piece of potential property. But that did not happen. And so um, the other piece of it is uh, what I understand is that IRG is also very interested in the land itself, not necessarily that building um, but it is not a. Uh, it is not in the hands of anyone other than IRG, and at a place right now where any negotiations or any conversation um, really has to happen with them, um, and um, and that's kind of where you know where things are at. Um, clearly, so uh, the private the sector is really the, the private sector is really like involved in it. It's yes. not like they've and, given up on us. <laughs> right. And I will also say Bonsai Garden, Rhodey Garden, those things are uh, community investments and they are part of remaining there. There's no uh, concern that I have or have I've heard that there's any other uh, anything going to happen there at all. And so. Um, I know also there has been a lot of focus on the North Lake area mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of work done um, around seeing if they could do some mitigation of what they thought was, you know, harm to uh, the land right there around the lake, but that, um, you know, everything kind of was done um, and are at a place now where there was um, nothing more legally that could happen and that, you uh, it was determined that the IRG was doing uh, what they needed to do to um, within the guise of whether it's SEPA or the environmental um, laws. And so, um, you know, continue to uh, have eyes on and continue to think about the uh, opportunity, as you say, um, Richard, not only to maintain the balance of open space, but also really think about economic development and and what we can continue to do um, to think about bringing revenue in um, to increase the property values and also then to be able to increase the services, supports and resources to the people of the 30th. So eyes on Weyerhaeuser property, but right now um, it's, it's, there's nothing actively um, happening right now with that particular building um, that I can report out on. Rep Taylor, do you have any Additional? I, I, other than, you know, from my perspective, the private sector is working on its own, you know, private sector solution. And when they need us, they will call us um, for support. And, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the DES, looking at the property for the purpose of that very specific purpose, that's that, 
they may come back at the future, but it just doesn't seem like we need to get involved quite, quite yet. Um, I, I feel like um, th there are a lot of really interested um, individuals. Uh, we're all invested in this beautiful property. We want to see it, it get repurposed. And, and I, I think that IRG is leading the way on that. And I defer to their judgment on the property that they own. Okay. And that gives us about a couple of minutes apiece for any closing remarks from each of you. What I will say is that um, we are very much committed to being responsive as leaders. And there are a lot of questions and a lot of concerns community members have come to us in various areas, everything from healthcare. Um, I mean, there's been many hospital mergers that have led to um, the loss of services, even in our community, and um, in the increased costs of services. And when I hear from constituents saying, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pay for uh, my medicine and rent, I, I'm, I'm taking that very, very seriously. Um, of course, you've heard um, concerns about um, you know, rental costs and, and housing. We will continue to address that. We have heard from uh, residents around what is our response in the behavioral health world and what is our response in public safety. And there are things that are best handled on statewide solutions so that we're not creating an island unto ourselves. Right now, we, we know that um, we could be more collaborative in, down here in South King County and we can find ways to be heard in Olympia. And I think that with Senator Wilson and myself and other colleagues of South King County um, districts, we are um, being heard loud and clear by the leadership um, in both parties, because I would say we have Republican leaders who are from South King County on our mm -hmm. mutual interests and the excitement around and the action around what we need to do that may be unique in South King County. Um, I'm, I'm so um, committed to working with you on those. We might have different strategies and I, I will continue to listen and I will continue to take action. And my hope is that where we share values, we can um, move into alignment into community. I just uh, want to say thanks all for being here today. If you're joining us on the live stream and know that we understand the 30th includes a lot of different communities and, uh, you know, Algona, Pacific, Auburn, Des Moines, Kent, as well as uh, Federal Way. And we need to make sure that we're addressing the issues and the concerns and the challenges of all of the folks that we are serving and hopefully uh, that we do that. I think you also heard from Rep. Taylor that um, much of what we do, there has to be a legislative nexus. So uh, we'll connect folks and do the best we can, but also our job is to figure out what the role is and if there is a role that the state plays in those solutions. Um, and that we each come with perspective, life experience, and also the ability to influence uh, legislation and bills in different arenas at different times. And you heard today we have different areas of expertise, but we trust, I think, each other and our team implicitly, and we learn from each other and we keep each other abreast of what's going on so that when the bills do become uh, in front of us, either when in committee or on the floor, that we're doing a due diligence in understanding what we're voting for and understanding not only the intent, but the impact it has on for the largest number of individuals that we serve. And we will continue to do that, continue to have open doors um, and also open ears and look forward to just continuing our work together um, in a solution focused way uh, so that we all come out on top and that as a community, we're all better uh, for the work that we're doing collectively. And I just really appreciate my, the partnership I have with Rep Taylor and want to um, thank all of you again for being here today. And please reach out uh, to our offices if you have follow-up questions or concerns. And that concludes today's town hall. Again, thanks to everyone who took the time to participate. And please enjoy the rest of your Saturday.